Okay, it's about time if we just do a quick sound check and visual check with Eli or Kyle. And okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Uh, uh, the rest of you can just mute for now so we don't get background noise. Sometimes that might mess things up. So um, today is going to be a little bit unusual because we're going to look at architecture, but we're going to look at the void in the architecture to see some urban planning schemes for Paris, which are the same times of the early Renaissance. And we'll push through three schemes here. We'll draw one in detail. Then we'll push through more schemes uh, towards Louis the 14th and just show the models and some general ideas of how they're shaping the growth of Paris. I also thought since this is the, the last um, sort of synchronous meeting for the sketches before break, what I'm gonna do over break, I'm still gonna meet Tuesday if you can make it or not, but I think I'm gonna push forward and do maybe four drawings, four different lectures next week to kind of get ahead. And that way we can pull away from yeah. your need to draw that last week of studio work uh, later in late April or early May. We'll just kind of get ahead of the game. We're gonna have four lectures over spring break. Kaylee, can you, can you mute real quick? Great, thanks. <laughs> so, um, if uh, you have any questions about the trip, just always uh, just email me about those. We're getting closer and closer with the final details um, in terms of the program over there. Uh, they're busy tapping us into all of our sites. And one of the sites you're gonna see immediately is the Place de Vosges here shown on the screen. This is a little model of the space, which seems kind of normalized, but it's kind of a spectacle because it's a pure prism of space, it's a pure square, 
in the middle of medieval Europe, so to speak, coming out of the Middle, middle Ages into the Renaissance period. Henry IV, who was a bit of a urban planner, uh, wanted to do something for the city there where he sort of structure the language of the growth of the city. So he tore down a few buildings and worked with a, a designer to fulfill the Place de Vosges. And he called it the Place Royale, so the royal family place in Paris. It's in the fourth round, so it's actually very close to Accent's office in the fourth district over there. And its nickname for the area is called the Marais. So the, um, the time period for this is right at the turn of the century. So it's actually before some of the ecclesiastical work we did the last two weeks. Uh, but basically Henry IV, between the years of about 1605 to maybe the 1615s, he works with several urban planning cities. We're going to take a look at a couple of them here. And then we're going to draw into more is, is uh, Place de Vosges. What we'll, we'll do is kind of move to this one and then we'll step away from it, introduce the other two, then we'll come back and do some of the more detailed and value aspect of this drawing. So let me title that for you. Place is a way of saying plaza or piazza. That's the French word for an urban place. And from the current name is Vosges. That's a region in France. Up until it had its name changed later on, it was the Place Royale, again, off of the royalty that was the benefactor in terms of the original financing for it. So he wanted to put a royal square on the site and then all the peripheral residences around this square, this open space. And this is really a gift to the city to say, we're gonna dedicate open place and not just sort of have real estate build up the value of all it with architecture, and that really makes Paris kind of wonderful because I keep mentioning it's one of the densest cities, not so much in population anymore, but in terms of architecture and square foot, it's really packed across the whole inner circle around the periphery highway. So when you come to a little small jewel like this, it's really a relief in Paris to have these well-designed, well-articulated places. And so because this is so close to accent and in the middle of all your apartments, uh, we'll see or not if we're going to start our first meeting after you fly in on those that Monday night, if we can't get many of the students just to come and kind of check in late afternoon, because it's good to push yourself anyway in Paris when you travel that far and not just go to bed early, you want to kind of stay up as long as you can so you can beat jet lag, jet lag as soon as possible. This is a great place to do it because it's outdoors. You meet at the equestrian statue of Louis XIII. Henry IV was his father who did the design. And eventually, to celebrate the Place and his father's name, there's an equestrian statue that used to be in bronze. Of course, during the Revolution, they would melt that down to use the bronze for other things. And finally, 1819 is replaced by the present stone statue. So it's really a, a real simple formal idea of having a square and plan type and then subdivide the square into four quadrants and use diagonals to link the corner axes of the square in terms of how it sits in the city. This is actually an open street that goes from the neighborhood of Paris, comes through the plaza east to west. And then from the south, the spine comes up underneath the Queen's Pavilion and then goes around the place in the front. And then she comes over to the King's Pavilion directly across from hers. So I'll end up drawing the King's Pavilion on the north end there. So we see some detail of it. It's not a spectacular piece of architecture per se, but the language of the urban vocabulary of giving this to the public good, the public domain, is a spectacle in architectural history, particularly in Paris here, because it's, it's a new idea. The idea of organizing a city grid and something this sort of um, prototypically pure was a real strong gesture there over time in French culture. So if you step away from the model, the easiest way to see this when we draw into it is to simply start with the square which is the basis for the green space. So once you step off the little ring road here, and that really is a simple lane of traffic and some parking now, it's a very quiet pedestrian space even though cars are allowed in. And as I mentioned before, at the top of it, on the north end, the street actually goes through in a neighborhood. So it carries beyond either side. So that's a, that's a different type of aspect than the south, 
because the south has closed corners where all the little pavilions along the outside rim meet and join in that corner. Here it opens up to a street. So the axis from the south is actually beneath the building here. Going out to the north, it's beneath the King's Pavilion to an arcade, which will draw on later up here with the elevation. And it's just a wonderful jewel, kind of releases Paris proper because the French, different than Americans, a lot of times they don't entertain in their living rooms. They don't even have a word for home. It's always the maison, the house, where we have a home, which is more of a, oh, sort of a special sentiment toward the idea of being in a house as a home. In France, they use public spaces and cafes and places to meet out there. So this is a great sense of being a living room for the neighborhood in the Marais district. So inside that is the full the square of just the green space that's around that then. And then there are four blocks of very manicured. It's probably obviously not the original design for vegetation, but really orchestrated um, cubic volumes of trees that are then given an L shape to define yet another box inside that. So once you come up to the plaza, you can see beneath the trees and through it, but you also see a whole series of squares from the plan come up and marshal up three dimensionally. They kind of enclose. Once you're in here, it's even calmer than the outside. So this is all foot traffic in there. And then we see the actual plains of grass that are here in France, which are sometimes limited to public use. More and more, it's been Americanized where people use the lawn. But sometimes you'll find in Paris, you might find it odd that you'll be walking around and there's no people actually on the lawn because in some cases they treat that as part of their floral garden and they don't want people tramping on it and playing games on it. They'll have dedicated place for that, but sometimes you'll see a little sign that says pelouse interdite. So it's forbidden to be on the grass there. So sometimes you might lay down or sit down on the grass, start to sketch, and all of a sudden a local police whistle you off because they don't treat all their lawn like we do in the States. Here though, because there's so much pressure, this is the only really nice open area of this scale in this part of town. So it gets a lot of, of pedestrian pressure throughout the day and certainly on the weekends. And then around that, if we took right in the center of this circle, uh, this square now, do a little circle there for where Louis, Louis XIII statue is. That actually, if we're looking at this now and trying to project up in the model to say that the walls of the architecture comes out from that, if we did that in 3D, we can use this one point to project off from the corners at every pavilion. And you can see how every line here drawn radiates off that one point. So each one of the particular things the king was selling as a real estate venture, so to speak, they're all gonna radiate off that one point. So we're pulling the plane of the ground up into the air in three dimensions here to kind of articulate a radial grid of apartment blocks, which spring up typically two stories in the front elevation and then a third under the roof line itself. Uh, and yet in the Kings and the Queen Pavilion, they're higher up because they actually have the axis beneath We'll draw those in later that you leave the plaza from that to the north and the south. So our next step after kind of raising up the front wall from the grade there is to kind of establish that play of the roof line. So the pitch, if we drew, let's, we'll come on the east and west side here. We'll do the one straight across. The pitch rises up to a hipped roof on all these elements. So kind of in a quick projection up into the roof area here, each one rises up to a flat area. So each one's got its own definition of being its own little pavilion on the plaza. And those are gonna wrap around and ring up here towards the King's Pavilion. And you don't have to sort of indicate them all identical, just kind of once you start, just like typical sketching is viewed, it kind of fills in that language all the way around that. Maybe down here, it's appropriate to do the Queen's Pavilion a little bit closer, and then just kind of fade out that language as you get toward the corners here. 
So the, the goal of this, and this is where it's kind of provocative as a more contemporary idea of architecture. In a sense, it's a bit speculative. It's if we build this, will people come? The king, when he built this whole thing for private in individuals, his stipulations were that none of the parcels, if you bought them, the king could be subdivided and no facades um, would, could deviate from the uniform brick and stone design. And we think it's by an uh, architect named Louis Metizo at the time. And we'll see that also he speculated for Place Dauphine, the next one we'll take a look at in a second. So there's a circulation gallery, which is really nice about this. It's not as if this is all public ownership over to the ground. When you get to the first floor level, and we'll do this on the King's Pavilion, there's an arcade that runs higher for the King and then drops down low for all the architecture around the entire skin of this cube. So sheltered, if it's raining outside or the few times it snows or inclement, the whole first floor beneath these buildings is open to the public too. Not only is it an outdoor space, but it's a semi-public, semi-private kind of cloistered space inside of that too, which is a wonderful environment because then the vendors who work in the back shops behind these have their cells and wares. And a lot of this is very commercial space, not all residential anymore. It's residential up above, but that open first floor is really a spectacle, makes it a really lively kind of perky space because there's artists and artisans and small boutiques and cafes and restaurants that kind of ring that whole bottom aspect. And so I talked about, I'll do this in detail here and show it more in a little bit, is it's an actual arcade. So in the King's version, there's three arches at the bottom there that support that. And they separate into the sort of triglyph, the three ideas of how they set up the two floors above that. And then finally spring into the roof, but then has three more dormer windows on top of that. So they're all three-story apartments, but the last one is really more for the servants who live under the roof line. And so they can pop up. As you draw any of this out, and want to do more and more detail of a, of a one-dimensional perspective, a one point from the air, you can take a flat 2D design and make it seem three-dimensional by kind of building it out in space that way. So as you move away around this edge, we're gonna see barely the two sides of this one, but we're gonna see more of the side that's closer to us on these and then more of the sides of those hip roofs coming down there, more there, more there, because we can't see the other side from this viewpoint. And as soon as you come on that, it flips over to this side so that we see more of these built out. And then it stops because it's a, it's a pretty modest height for the rest of the city of Paris. And it's really amazing how this has survived under the incredible real estate practices in Paris over the years. It's really forced the values of things to rise as tall as possible to that seven level. And these are really sort of the diminutive type of architecture that we'll see in a second when we draw this up here to scale. So uh, what I'd like you to do is switch off of Place de Vosges really quick to talk about the growth of this idea because Place de Vosges is one of a series of spaces across Paris that you'll see in your daily activities. We cross the city all the time in lectures on foot and you'll be walking by these spaces. So the next one I want to look at is the same king and the same architect want to do something a year and a half later. So in 1607, he went to the point of Ile de la Cité, and that's the little bit of land that's on an island in the middle of the Seine River. When you come to the point of that island facing west, it actually triangulates itself. So imagine the same language of Place Dauphine, because that apparently was successful, now becomes the language of the point of the island. So now today in contemporary Paris, when you make your way and in broader sense, if you leave Notre Dame back here to the east side of Paris and make your way to the tip of the Paris island of the Cité, you're going to come to a point where land just comes to a point and jets out a little park there that will we'll sit down and wait before we take our river tour because they ticket just off that little park there. But just above you, the first bit of architecture on the original island of Parisi, back when, even before the Letitian city of Rome came there and, and overcame the local tribes there, this is the architecture you'll first see today, and it's from 1607. 
So much like the King's Pavilion, the two twin pavilions now face west and they're very prominent elevation for the whole city of Paris to see. And then what they did for the Dauphine here, and hence the name Place, Place Dauphine, they created an isosceles triangle here, which will organize the shape and relate it to how the land was bowing out to that point. It's the same type of delicate stone and brick architecture. So it's modest in materiality, and then it's, it's a royal place. And so it's the same thing. He would make sure people at this time would honor his eldest son, the future king. That's what they called him Dauphine. There was nothing to prevent subsequent modifications after the Bourbon family, after the revolution. So it's happened here, which makes um, Place de Vosges more remarkable is this still looks like it's 1605. This will look like it's 1605 from this point, but this organization of all being identically the same has changed radically. So the elevations have changed on the outside, the heights of buildings have changed. It still holds its triangular form, but even these two parts of the base of the triangle have been torn down, which kind of makes it more open to the Palace of Justice across the street. But obviously with the ebb and flow of real estate markets, it changes the culture of, of how buildings are used over time. But you'll see that they're related. Once you travel to both of them in person, you'll see their kindred spirits by the same designer and the same urban planning king at the time who wanted to really modernize Paris. And then before we come back to Place de Vosges, the sort of the, the promise of this is adopted then by Louis the 13th, Henry the Fourth. Um, son, but then also the grandson of Henry IV was Louis XIV, and he's got a really significant version uh, twice over, and we'll look at one in model here, then we'll draw the next one in future weeks. And the one we're not going to draw to show in model form is again a square, but it's got camfered edges to it, so really it's sort of a, an odd shaped octagon, and this is referred to as the Place Vendôme. The Vendôme being another area in France, and in this case, the Place Vendôme was uh, another gesture towards planning ideas of contemporary cities to how we think of them today, where this literally was a money-making venture to, to help the coffers of Louis XIV on another, another front. Not only were the wars, the new banking he was doing with the, with the Netherlands banks, uh, he was growing his, his uh, financial gains by many, a many different ways. And one of them was really speculative design. So in this case, he also went to a growing part of Paris to the west of Place de Vosges, um, and even a bit west of the Place Dauphine, but across the river on the right bank, which was the, the last part of property in Paris to develop is on the right bank, because the left bank was on a hill, so the, the land was dry and great for buildings. The right bank was actually part of land coming down toward the river, so it was much swampier, so it was harder to build on, so it took longer for that to really take off. Now it's, it's probably more expensive land in terms of what's built there, because this piece at Vendôme today um, has held on to its status as the highest culture for hoteling, for jewelry, for shops, for boutiques, and things like that, in the, between the... Uh, second, first, and then down to Champs-Élysées, this is the place to be for the wealthy of the wealthiest. Uh, and just to give you a significant connection to Place Vendôme, if we have our highest points in our American version of Monopoly, the last two spaces of real estate there, one of them is the Place Vendôme and Rue de la Paix, which is adjacent to it. So you'll come in again, just like you did at the other ones with a big north-south axis to it, and then there'll be a ring around it outside, but this is devoid of trees, if any, there's a handful, but basically it's a very hardscape place because there's so much activities and things moving through that. It's a, it's a bigger, broader scale of a place. And so with the designers back here, Mansart's nephew, who we, we met, uh, Francois Mansart, the last two lectures, now his nephew who worked for the king, the next generation of Mansart's, basically designed a skin which had been cut out of the early medieval Paris and then clarified and modernized in a sense. And then people would pay for slips of land behind that skin, but the design was all coordinated by the same really powerful structural language of what behind that skin is. And this starts 
uh, right around the, the 1639, 1640s, and eventually Louis XIV does Louis does uh, the Place Victoire. And then his son, actually the next king, which would be his, his great grandson, Louis XV, did the Place de la Concorde, which will also draw later to show this lineage of places in Paris are equally significant to the actual architecture. So that what people do is sort of urban gestures or also connects the city together. So it was sold to the city of Paris as at a certain point because the king couldn't make it by his own bankers and trying to be successfully as a business there. So the city worked on it. And again, all the prospective owners would be obliged to adhere to the architect's design for the facades. So that was the one key rule there. And it was governed by these colossal Corinthian pilasters that rise and make a real dominant, almost as if you're stepping into the palace of a king, although it was kind of retail version of it. The Saint Louis Square was, was Louis XIV, obviously at the time, but then obviously destroyed by the revolution. After the revolution comes Napoleon, so the column in the center becomes crowned by a statuette of Napoleon in 1810, and then he's replaced in 1814 when the Bourbon family is restored and now a fleur de lis gets, is the symbol of the Bourbon line, takes down Louis, uh, Napoleon. By 1833, the Bourbon family's out and now Napoleon's back on, not so much in uh, Caesar's garb because he was trying to connect himself to Roman rule, but more of a frock coat, more of a people's coat. And he's been there ever since. It was toppled in the commune in 1871. So he came down, but then rebuilt three years later. And so what you see up there now, Napoleon on top of a big, huge colonnade there is um, a version of a version of a version over time here. So back to Dauphine, and we'll start to look at some of the, the key elements of the architecture on its place there. So what we're gonna be working on is as you make your way off of the Boulevard Saint Antoine de Rivoli on this end and push toward the plaza, you'll be just, re it'll be remarkable how quiet Paris gets by having this enclave that's sort of forced it in here and makes it very personalized all of a sudden. A big roaring city kind of dies down to a human scale. And then you'll see uh, Louis XIII in the center. We'll walk past that and now we'll take a look at a little triptych of architecture that shows the glory of the King's Pavilion with two normalized pavilions on either side of that. So we'll come down to the base of this, which will be just because I'm stacking these drawings together, it falls kind of right at the height of our thing at this grade level. And then the first job we have is to simply establish a pure circle for the top of the arches, just to make sure you understand where the arch is coming from. The largest one will be the King's Pavilion. And it repeats itself all the way down the street, so we'll stop after these three pavilions here. And then we know that from the Roman times, because this is Renaissance picking off of that classical language, right when the arch comes down and becomes vertical, that's referred to as the spring point, and that's where we drop down the sides of the arch. And that way you've, you've completed something that's very classical in its language, that there's a real formal shape there but it becomes orthogonal and then carries the structural forces down the grade. And we can just repeat that along the way. So it tells you exactly where that spring is. You don't wanna to get too lazy with that. And as soon as it comes absolutely horizontal from the middle of that circle, it becomes a straight line. And if you do them well in the beginning, it'll just sort of fan out and fade to the paper and become more normalized that way. And then on top of each axis here, we're simply gonna move up in sort of a, a pattern of taking the width of that arch and then having a center line of windows are gonna rise up off of each arch. So on the, north, on the um, secondary pavilions that rim the whole thing, there's a tier of four for, um, there's a center one, because this is the King's Pavilion, that's gonna have five sets of windows to it. So the major one in the center is a bit wider and then a pair of double windows. They're going to share 
the arch as well as the space between the two arches. So in a sense, we're doing columns of vertical space along the architecture, and then it'll rise up to the seat of the roof line. So the two paired pavilions which flank the king on either side, and then the massive roof that comes down and flares out to its edge and kind of overlaps its neighbors a little bit. So two typical Northern European French hats on top of two-story volumes. The king's obviously sets up taller because this is the major arch which runs right through the space and the similar arch is over here in the Queen's Pavilion. Now, as I mentioned, because of this is a great architectural space, and so you can get rents for that, or you can put your servants' quarters up in there. There's always space underneath those roofs, so we'll come off behind that break point and pop in a series of window elements on top of that. That break into that plane of the roof line coming down diagonally. And then because this is the classical order, they're going to be completed with a certain type of base, shaft, and capital to them all. So in this case, the king gets the semicircular arch, and the two twins are triangular pediments. The two central one are triangular. And the two outside, which almost are more like service windows just for an oculi, are actually circular windows at the edges. And they will also have a round roof on those. So that completes the language of the head of the building. Again, to heat these like any of the buildings from the time, they'll have the large chimney chases that'll come up. And that will infill the skin of the building. So once you get to the top, imagine this being like a triumphal arch. And I think we'll be drawing one for Louis XIV and probably Napoleon as well later on in terms of their significance. But in a triumphal arch, the arch rises up and it comes to its break points as part of the classical language. In this case, it's got two wings or pavilions to it on either side and then drops out the edge of the building. And then these two share that edge. And from that point, there's a base. And that base allows you to set up the first tier of windows. And this is the main floor, so living quarters and the entertainment quarters for the king. And then in a sense, just like our classical language, those windows will also have their hats to them. So it's round, it's triangular, it's round, it's triangular, and it's round. And that building's gonna end too. So it has its little cornish or top to it. And then the base of the next series of windows, which are smaller, they're still larger than the side pavilions, here we go again with the last tier on the second floor, the primary base. So to give its proportion next to the king, the king steps taller. So over here, we come off the base of the arches. They finalize the lower level, the gallery that wraps around the whole plaza. And then we have, again, two tiers of windows. And in this case, they're the same size as they stack up. And this is not unlike what we're gonna see in the next generations, what other kings are doing. They change the language of vocabulary, the actual type of classicism they apply, but it's the same type of formula of simply how much square footage around this space can generate how much wealth and what's the, the equation there in terms of making this profitable. But they are compared to the ecclesiastical work or some of the palatial work we'll see later on with the 14th. These are very modest structures. Um, brick is very common, and this is used in the front skin of the building. So Louis the 14th hadn't got this sort of gregarious exponential use of details of the classical language that certainly his son and his grandson will have in the next reign, which births Renaissance into the Baroque element. So these are fine sort of jewel-like pieces that are still intact, still in situ in the city of Paris from the, the first part of the 17th century. So when you run this line across, make sure you're connecting the two pavilions together on either side. 
is very organized, just like we're drawing it here, it was probably sketched out by the design architect at the point on paper. So we again, we see the profession of architecture taking root as a office-based drawn aesthetic. And now we can apply some of the value and talk about the language of, of how the lights and darks play into this. So uh, right away, what we're going to do is we're going to assume a condition of the sun. And in this case, because the entire elevation here faces due south, and it's fairly flat because it's Renaissance, the only projection we have is that this pavilion of the king, uh, it's flush to this, but it has a little bit of reveal here, so not much of a shadow cast there to show it's in front of the other people. But it does, because it's taller, have an important shadow line over here, which this face casts a shadow on this corner of the building. That's one of the few times you can actually build the idea of the skin coming off of its adjacent skin to it because they're almost the same plane in space. It literally is tied just like this drawing down below. It's a clean, crisp line of architecture. So everybody there does not, can, is not allowed to personalize their outside skin. And I'm sure the historic records today are really good about that as well when people move in and out of the the residential or commercial space in the properties today. So one thing we can do though, because there is sky beyond this, and again, from this view, there's probably views in the distance of taller buildings now, because Paris certainly has been, been built taller than just three or four stories across the rest, but we'll leave the rest of the city uh, to another day behind it. So we'll just come to the edges of these and show the architecture coming down. And then we can use the top plane as a quick tone because it's the strongest value on the front skin outside the red brick, which we'll detail later. So just wash that around very quickly as a start. And then to get some depth because one of the darkest volumes, obviously, are the interiors of the windows, which we'll get to because that's fairly detailed. But beneath it, inside these arches, is actually an exterior room that's sheltered by the architecture above. This is an arcade that the, the city walks through on a daily basis. This is a commuter route for people on their way to work on either side. So it's a working structure. It's not just you're in and you're out. This is kind of an in-between space, which is really a, a coveted part of square footage of the city of Paris. So. But in the daylight, because it's deep enough, it's going to seem very dark compared to the rest of the information. So within all those arches, we can wash a nice dark mid gray for now. And we'll kind of eclipse and, and blend the two sketches together here. And again, as we move to the right, because it becomes redundant, you can trail off and not do the exact same technique across. It kind of builds interest if you're not sort of um, re redundant with the information and just sort of coloring the same across. Show that in cross of the skin of the, of the architecture, you're changing your high points and your low points. So as I mentioned, this will, this building will be a little bit in front, so it casts a shadow down to here. But the rest of it is kind of difficult because it's very fine Renaissance detail that's very planar. So not a whole lot of mass to work with. Our next little piece that'll show some volume are that these um, dormers up here are flat just like the elevation, but the roof behind them is canting back to this pitch. So just like this cast shadow over here, each one of these will have a little bit of a shadow cast at an angle and then from the top of the window, it'll come down to meet it, making a small, sharp triangle. And once we give some value to that area, you'll see those windows kind of pop off the back skin. And so now we're sort of building some sense of depth, which is difficult in Renaissance because it's a very sort of plainer language as it grows out. As it develops itself, it becomes form related as well and, and kind of jumps in terms of the gigantic as we'll see in the Baroque element in a couple of weeks. So now this is where we slow down because we have to work with the windows. And just like we did last week, instead of drawing the structure of the window, we're gonna show the interior only and then leave the structure as the paper white. 
So this is just a system where you set up the idea that there are going to be six lights, meaning six planes of glass within every window and the repetitive. So if I show you one quickly, you simply have to go across the skin here and do two thirds of them or three quarters of them, leave some just page white and don't worry about them because once you set up the, um, the visual image of what you're trying to entertain the audience with, the people will fill in the ones you haven't done. So let's just start right in the center here. And all we have to do is we're gonna work again with the side of a pencil that's got a little bit of blunt edge on the corner and just do the top two squares, which are smaller than the bottom two, which might be almost twice the depth as the top you started with. And that little bit of white you leave, leaves the architecture that's gonna hold up the glass. And just repeat that. So each one takes about four or five seconds. And there's no rule that you have to do them all identical. You can change your pressure and make them lighter, but you're just moving across the skin now and trying to articulate those. And so right now, with even doing much sketching at all, I've got a nice flat edge on the pencil. And so one stroke kind of gives the thickness of all the openings that I have there. And we'll work it over here. And after a couple of windows, we'll just stop. Because we've started the, the, the graphic idea for this. And then we'll just trail off over here just to one or two and barely any on the side. Trail off over here as well. And that kind of suffices to show there's some animation along that skin. We're far enough away, we're not gonna see into spaces there and it's got its, its um, muttoning of the windows. So it, it breaks a clean view into it. What we can do in terms of this being a front elevation to make it perspectival, if you, were to, if you were to be standing on that and looking at that at eye height, this is about the height of a person on this space. We would see the underside of this arch from above us, and then its twin on the other side of the property. We'd see the right side of these arches, and the right side of these, and the right side of that. And we'd see the left side of these arches going around this side of us. And that'll give some depth and thickness to it because now we come in and do a dark aspect to show we're going to move through this arcade and go into those spaces on either side. And just a hint of that depth of how thick the architecture is to get into the arcade kind of gives more mass and weight to the base to hold the building up above. So next, next step is also kind of um, related to the very delicate detail. Between all the windows, there is coin work. And coin work is where you take a higher quality stone and you break it back and forth and create a pattern along the skin of the elevation and then do the twin on the other side. And then the space in between becomes the red brick. So that stonework here, which is a greater expense, keeps the cost down low by having it interstitial with the brickwork. And so that happens with sort of a, a line left white in the middle of the windows. And at the corner also being white, when you come to the edge remains the stone color too on all these pavilions. But between them and the windows now is the darker of the brickwork. So you need to leave that little bit of dark next to the light in there, just so we see the pattern of something moving from the base of all these connecting different skins together. It's a very delicate detail and we don't want it to 
to illustrate it now and design detail it, we just want to hint at the change of variant tones across that skin. And again, it might come more detail as you push toward the King's Pavilion. And for the King men, we'll spend more time with one more pass of value to articulate that unit. So we can come back into some key windows and go even blacker. So we have darks within the dark area. And again, don't be uniform. Just pick out certain panes. It's going to have um, more value in certain zones. And then we'll start to come to the edges of the building because they're gonna hold space on either side. And remember to always, there's a couple of finials up here, but you wanna run your value to the corners of them and then let go and chase it across the different value until you come to the other edge and then maybe strengthen it again. So it's the same material, we know it's the same tone. We tend to wanna to color in the same thing, but if you vary your gradation across, it creates more interest, interest across that skin as if the play of light and clouds above is sort of helping that process. So start strong in this corner. You can put little finials in and tighten it up to this edge is stronger and stronger. And now go deeper into that shadow, deeper into those windows up in the attic there. And then fade out to the edge because you don't want to take, if this is the core of your sketch, you don't want to take interest away to the edge of the sketch on the other side. And it's not unlike when we looked at Mesa on the Feet last week we saw the essence of two stories of space in the, in the build out of our perspective for the front and the central panel has got its pitched roof out of the French style. So the architecture that Mansart builds 20 years from now is predicated in the early Renaissance architecture of places like Plastophine and um, Plastivoge. So you get sort of the simplicity on the side things, a little more heroic now in terms of the classical language we sketched last week. So it's a step towards the Baroque they have already been to an architecture. So today we're kind of stepping back with the first two plazas, knowing that Van Dome comes after the early work of Francois Mansart. So if we can move really quickly back to this plan over here to make this look dimensional, we're gonna come in knowing this is the, the grass area down below to show, because it's also a green up above, the very strong articulated pieces of tree line, which are boxed out by really severe or uh, geometric pruning through the course of the year. They're very elegant in the winter when there's no foliage because you see just the structure in space. And they're really great spaces that really privatize individual conversations when you're beneath them. So just the way the trees are sort of really controlled by man shows how the Renaissance um, sort of design entity around the, the grown environment, the natural environment is a different language. It's a different take on the history of how man's addressed um, floral language. But we want to, just because we picked out South coming over here, projected a little cut value on that form, we can come over on this, say, this part and say, this is East and it's later morning, that's still in shade. And then from the South, it casts an entire shadow under the ground here. So from the Queens Pavilion on, that whole skin is dark and shade, but these are lit up. And so the only part we're gonna see as dark over here, we just kind of sketch in a little bit of the idea of the arcade beneath as it goes around. So this is kind of a sketch format, not to draw it in, just hint at the idea of 
a dark at the base. So it's more like a, a controlled doodle to kind of activate that base. And then we, we come back in and show the throw now that this will actually then cast a shadow onto this plane over here. So that becomes darker than the skin itself. So that area of shade at the base of the building over to this part is darker than the skin of the buildings because the brightest is lit and then the shade side is second and the third is the thrown shadow. So on that angle, we can come over on all the higher trees that are here and show their projection into the landscape too. So boxing those out gives us this idea of just how prominent they are by how tall they are now lifted off the space. So we can build those boxes up as if they're rising off the ground here. And so in a sense, the trees themselves kind of become architectural as a, a device to use space in an urban environment. So now you can see that I've lifted a from my but I'm telling you now there actually are probably a story and a half types of quasi bush trees that grow up and create this enclosure for us. Maybe we can pull those off the paper just with our value series of having lights and darks. So these are all lit, they'll be a little brighter. Maybe the roofscapes themselves are a little bit gray on either side. And because we've already detailed the skin, we don't have to put that detail in this sketch. This is more about the urban gesture itself. Maybe to correlate the two, we can come back into the movie here on the north end and kind of finish that, knowing that all the vertical lines are all being controlled by one point. And we haven't done a one point perspective yet, but they're really handy if you ever want to study a space in 2D from an aerial view that to do it flat gives you information about size and stuff, but to draw the point away, and sometimes you do the point over here so it's overloaded to one side, but it's a good way to study the variety of heights around that too. So how is the skin part of the plan type too? We could probably wash a little tone on those elements there. And I don't think we have the scale to really necessarily wanna put in cars and things, but the ones that drive longer to give you scale for it, if this is a person's height, next to Place de Vosges. So basically a two-story arch in the base there for all the commercial work. Then a parked car might be oh, this large. So there's the glass for it and it has its cast shadow. Just to give some scale or just how large the park is, it's like two or three cars that are parked along the one side, which they allow during the day. You know, and that also gives that anthropomorphic scale because you know the, the body's related to the car. And so the scale of a car gives you an idea of how large the person would be in that too. So obviously this is a smaller scale than this one kind of blown up to show that pavilion. Is that why these two don't relate to each other yet, but difficult to show a person in a bird's eye view at a one point. So last little bit, every time there's a type of window penetrating the skin, there's the lintel up above which casts a shadow line on the glazing and window structure. So that will set the glass now back into the wall more to have that on there. Just the top of all your top two panels will just have a nice dark line to it. That should complete the work for today. We'll move, um, uh, this will be similar language. This will be probably day two after we visit Notre Dame. We'll make our way to the tip of this island. So you'll see the conjunction of those two right away. Later in the summer, we'll go to Place de la Concorde because that's right on the river edge. We'll go to Place Victoire on uh, an early walking tour. And then at some point, you'll actually go to Vendôme as well and see some of the more spectacular hotels and 
fashion models walking around in their Maseratis and Bugatti cars, and photo shoots, because this is one of the most precious pieces of real estate in the entire country. So we'll do another one uh, asynchronous this week on Thursday. Then again, like I mentioned in the beginning, we'll try to jump ahead over break uh, so that we can pull off that final week in the semester and wrap up with our 30 some plates you're going to have. And I mentioned the other day to Eli that these plates then are going to be um, taken from their 11 by 17 form here. You should scan them all just for a record. But then I'd like you to buy a 12 by 18 sketchbook and then put all these in the sketchbook every other page. And that way, when you go to Paris, you'll have these with a hardboard backing when you sit down. So you can continue to draw into them when they see the sites because you've got other places on the paper. You can draw other notes, details, thoughts you're having, observational things, something to add your impression of it as well as the sort of lecture material. So you complete your plates that way as you go through it. And you'll also have a blank sheet in between these to do something completely on your own based off of perspective or plan type, just to enrich this experience of observational sketching as you go through Paris. And then I'll also encourage you once you're in Paris to make sure when you carry around your artwork, you're regularly scanning it, either at Accent or their version of Kinko's over there. So you keep your record of your pieces because they're original artwork and you're traveling with them. And so you're gonna leave them behind at some point, a couple students will, at least you'll have the digital archive to re reclaim the record of them. So that's it for today. Uh, if I don't uh, see you in class this week, the students that are in the, the housing thing, then have a good break, have a safe break, keep sketching, keep thinking about Paris, and then I will send out information about the next piece of information we need from the independent study students that have signed up for the 390, 790, whatever section that is that Kyle has set up for the class to take that course this summer. Thank you very much. See you online.